consolidating the, the protein because it, there's a lot of factors that uh, need to be captured when you get protein folding or unfolding type of scenarios. These include the screening, so water does screen charge interactions. So if two charges were to interact uh, with, a, let's say, a very high interaction in vacuum, they will see each other much less in the case of water. So that makes a big difference. Uh, then there's other issues like hydrophobicity. So uh, parts of a molecule that doesn't like water will collapse to, to basically bind to each other. Uh, if you don't have the water, you, you want to observe this phenomenon, which is a collective phenomenon. It's very weak interaction, but collectively they are very important. Uh, and then there's other factors uh, such as hydrogen bonding with water or without water. Uh, so there's many factors that play a role. Uh, this is why we tend to do simulations in explicit water. So you have a, basically a, a bath of water molecules that surrounds the protein system. So you might have a simple box periodic boundary conditions where we have all these water atoms surrounding them. And then what you observe typically is that if this system is a hundred atoms, which is very small, uh, when you have the water it becomes a, a thousand atoms or, or even more in many cases. Uh, and that slows down your simulation quite a bit. If you think of it as two simple formulas, uh, instead of doing let's say a hundred something, hundred times hundred calculations, now we have orders of magnitude and squared more calculations to do in the simplest sense. So uh, it makes it much, much more slow. But the problem is we can't avoid it. <laughs> so uh, you spend most of your time trying to move around the solvent, uh, whereas uh, what you're really interested in is the solvent. Uh, that's one problem. Uh, the question you might ask next is, OK, how do you get around this problem? Uh, there are multiple ways. Uh, one is you can make these calculations simpler, so you can make it, uh, you can come up with some approximations of electrostatic interactions that uh, make the calculations much faster. Two, you can completely get rid of the water and instead uh, think of the implicit effect of water. So you can have mathematical terms that, uh, that describe the hydrophobic effects or uh, how the hydrogen bonding will change uh, or screening effects and all of these individual effects can try to capture them mathematically. Uh, this is also done, there are various uh, forms of doing this, but uh, it can get very expensive if you look at large systems. Uh, typically what you have to do is you look at the, uh, the area of the molecule that would be exposed to water. Uh, so you do a lot of volume type calculations, and if you have a lot of atoms, those calculations become much more expensive than the actual calculations you want to do. So you again run into problems there. So there's no easy solution, uh, but we do need typically the explicit solvent in the case of a protein. In the case of carbon nanotube, we might not need it. If you're doing an experiment in vacuum, uh, it's fine. But uh, you get graphene oxide and how they interface with each other. Uh, moisture plays a huge role in those interactions. So then, you not only need water, you need to know how much water there is in between the two the cases of the Yes. <coughs> and you can comment on what to do if you have high energy barriers in water, which we want to take advantage of that quite a long time to jump Yeah, out. so that's an excellent question. I, will, I was going to talk about that more <laughs> as we do this, but uh, we can talk about this uh, now. So what you do is, is you start from a molecular configuration, and typically what we think of the overall uh, progress in time is, is a, an energy landscape concept. So, you start from your, uh, let's say, one configuration, let's say you're here, uh, and then uh, as you simulate, you kind of bounce around, you're going this way, you're going that way, and so forth. But uh, you might be interested in getting here. And if you have an energy barrier that's sufficiently high, so you, uh, you're in a situation where you call uh, kinetically trapped. So you're trapped in here, you don't have enough energy to jump over this barrier, and then uh, you don't have a way of basically observing what happens here, which is the actual minimum or the most likely state of the molecule. So there's many, many, many different methods that people have developed uh, to be able to uh, look at these jumps from one state to the other. Uh, uh, most of these approaches basically add another potential to the system you have. So you basically add an artificial potential to make reduce this barrier to something you can jump over. And then you discount that, such as uh, umbrella sampling methods or uh, replication 
measurement methods, basically play around with temperature to, to make those jumps. So it, it goes into a depth, depth of uh, statistical mechanics, but uh, that's what typically people do. Uh, you look at the, it's almost like looking at the system uh, far from equilibrium or far from your starting state by like adding potentials to do that. Uh, individual parts of the energy landscape where uh, you can again do small scale calculations and look at it in But they are fairly advanced concept was. But we use them often. I mean, in many cases, you want to look at uh, far from equilibrium scenarios, so uh, you need those statistical methods to really you know, dig into the details of the whole world landscape. Is there a critical size in the domain to be sure that the relative boundary conditions are physically correct? Yeah, and uh, it depends on the system uh, to some extent. So uh, if you have uh, wave propagation, these kind of problems, uh, you want to make sure that the wavelength that is relevant to the problem you're looking at will not be changed by the fact that you don't have that kind of uh, I can't say, oh, you have to be at least this size, but uh, you have to bear in mind that if you are too small of size, you might be different. Um, the other issue is when you apply periodic boundary conditions to boundaries that are not really periodic, when you have a free surface at least. Kind of and so the corner, the corner of the domain should be flat and curved. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. Uh, yeah. if it's curved, of course, yeah. Actually, that's a really good question. So if you want to look at a limit vesicle, for instance, so the goals are round systems. Right? But most of the, the periodic boundary conditions we have are, are square. So if you just want to look at this part, and if let's say you know the curvature and everything, so you don't want to simulate the whole thing, but you just want to simulate this part, then you need the spherical boundary conditions, uh, which people are developing currently, uh, maybe even implemented. It's not the most straightforward thing to do, but there are methods for different kinds of problems. Most common is a box for a lot of simple systems in the course of the year. In energy simulations with hamster ratios, do you study soft materials? Mm -hmm. It's very different sampling of the equations. Yeah. So in the polymer situation of protein, you have the soft ones. Yeah. So uh, that goes back to this problem. I mean, you want to sample different things. Yeah. Uh, so I can give one example of the method. Uh, so let's say you have a simple heating system, uh, and then you want to you want to observe it in the unfolded state, so it's something like this versus folded state. Normally, this takes uh, about hundreds of nanoseconds. You want to know how that energy landscape varies, uh, let's say, from one state to the other. What typically people do is you apply an external potential, like a spring, in the simplest case, and then you change the spring constant, and you basically run uh, parallel simulations, you know, maybe a thousand simulations, each very short, but uh, still uh, looking at dynamics. And uh, what you can observe is basically you have many simulations, one is here, the other is here, the other is here, the others here, and then you have different potentials that you apply to the system, which is artificial, right? it's non physical, you have an extra spring in there. So, then what you do is you look at the distributions or the trajectories of how things move around that equilibrium position in the presence of the spring, and then you can uh, discount the effect of the spring when you do the, the sample. So, there's a uh, weighted histogram analysis method, uh, mostly statistical methods that we can do. Capture that, and then, and then you can recreate this energy landscape, and then basically get a fairly accurate solution. Can you give an example of graphene? Mm -hmm. Graphene is uh, very stiff in the plane of the outer plane salt. Nice to see. For those cases, suppose I wanted to simulate the, the graphene in a very good method to capture both the outer plane configurations, uh, which is salt, versus in the same system, we yeah. have widely different frequency. Do you want to capture the complete, for instance? Is that yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I mean, that, uh, under mechanical forces, I, it will depend on what kind of boundary conditions, but there, there should be ways that you can do that. Depending on how you pick your potentials, you might be able to see different kinds of 
change. Uh, I mean, there's still limitations, of course. I mean, there's the limitation of phosphorus in many cases, not for graphene necessarily. You might not be able to observe the state you want to observe. But, but uh, it, this is usually how, it's, how we can get around it. In many cases, we've demonstrated that it works. <coughs> This is sort of the future of where it's supposed to go. Because there's no method now that can really look at dynamics of particles in, in these uh, small nanoscale particles in, in, in these time scales of seconds or milliseconds and so forth. It's not possible with quantum mechanics. When you go to continuous methods, there's so many approximations that uh, you don't have that are heterogeneous structures you need to look at. So you have to go either with a particle solution or some sort of a finite element that keeps evolving in time, and uh, both are extremely difficult uh, to treat mathematically and uh, conceptually, I think, in my opinion, uh, is uh, how do you come up with a finite element that looks like a uh, protein that unfolds and falls back in this sort of thing. Those are very hard uh, problems that many people are looking at in both perspectives. So from finite elements, uh, like the methods like Immers, the electro kinetic uh, finite elements, uh, uh, we can do worse with these kinds of things. For more dynamics, there's many people trying to improve the uh, certain time scales uh, using supercomputers and so forth. Uh, for instance, Vijay uh, Pandey at Stanford does, uh, he uses basically uh, playstations and screensavers and all these things uh, across the world to, to improve the sample using this concept that I mentioned. And by doing so, they can look at misfolding of proteins, how they uh, fall differently uh, in biology which causes diseases. So proteins start to fall into this state, let's say, and it might get stuck in another state. And then the question is, uh, how can we sample with just short simulations uh, this, this phenomenon? So what they do is uh, use many playstations in the world that are sitting idle and try to solve the scientific problem. But that's a very challenging.
more than each CPU is looking at a very small number of ads. So then the issue becomes communicating between all the CPUs and that, be, that overwhelms the, the speed of the calculation. If you have a small system, like very small, and if you don't need one time scale to put this on your laptop, like a thousand times, ten thousand times, yeah, these usually can be treated unless you have very complicated potentials. If you have a billion atoms, that means you can really scale it linearly almost to like a supercomputer, so now you can use a thousand cores or even more. Uh, and and you, can, uh, you really need supercomputers, But they are very excessive. Except for weather calculations, which usually dominates a lot of the, the supercomputer, because they need a lot of computation. It's been done, so that's why I gave you the 